Hi everyone, my name is Joyce. I'm the Communications Manager at TechSoup Canada and I want to thank you all for joining us uh, during your lunch hour to just learn more about tech trends for this year and how to get your nonprofit started. Um, before we begin, I do want to talk a little bit about TechSoup Canada if you're not familiar with us. Uh, we are a nonprofit and our mission is to oh, let me just unpause my screen. Um, and our mission is to help other nonprofits use technology effectively. Uh, we do this in two ways. The first is to help you save money on technology products through the technology donations program. Um, and essentially what this is is uh, a program where we uh, partner with corporations like Microsoft, uh, Adobe, Symantec, um, and more to offer their services at either an outright donation or a significant discount. Uh, so as an example of the cost savings, uh, Microsoft Office Professional uh, retail price is about $500, uh, but if you qualify for the Microsoft program and you are a registered member, you can pick it up for $55. Um, so as you can imagine, the cost saving is quite significant once you start uh, thinking about all the staff that uh, is at your nonprofit that would need a copy of Microsoft Office. Uh, the second way that we want to help nonprofits is to uh, teach them how to think about technology effectively um, and also implement it at their own nonprofits. Uh, so what we do is we host webinars such as this for free. Uh, we curate and create blogs on our website um, and we also do so on our social media accounts. So if there's something that you're interested in learning about, feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to uh, make a resource for you. Uh, lastly, uh, TechSoup Canada, we are a program of the Centre for Social Innovation and we are also part of a global TechSoup network. Uh, so if you have uh, nonprofits and associations in your network that is outside of Canada, let them know that there is a TechSoup office nearby that is willing to help them with their technology needs. Uh, for today, we are uh, using GoToWebinar, and again, if you um, are joining us for the first time or it's been a while since you've been on this platform, a quick refresh. Uh, your the GoToWebinar panel um, is accessible on typically the right-hand side. You can also hide it if you want. Um, again, a reminder that everyone is on mute, uh, but you can't chat to us. There should be a chat box um, that you can put in if you have any concerns or comments. Um, and then you can also select your audio and troubleshoot it throughout the webinar. Uh, so if you find that my audio is not very good um, and you're not sure how to uh, adjust it, you can also switch to phone. Um, I do find that the conference line is a little bit more stable. Uh, so if you have audio issues, maybe you can try that option and um, be able to uh, help yourself there as well. Also for today, uh, what we want to quickly do is take a look at five tech and web design trends. For each trend, we'll do just a quick pulse check so you can think about how this will apply at your organization. Then we'll dive into what is it, like what is the trend, why is it important, and then we'll equip you with the steps and resources to move forward. Uh, so you can also pass this along to your colleagues and, and your team so you can be equipped for that trend. Um, and this is like me not quite sure how to uh, put these quick tech updates in. They're not quite trends, but I do think they're important. So at the end, just a very quick one minute update on some of the two things that I do think everyone should have on their radar. Um, at the end, we will have a Q&A period. Um, what I'll do is I'll uh, take all the questions that you will be putting into the chat box throughout the webinar, um, and I'll try to answer as many as possible. Um, if I'm not able to get to your question, there is a post webinar survey that will pop up after the webinar ends. Um, and there you can specify, like, please, you know, follow up with me. You didn't get to my question, and I'll do my best to um, get in touch with you afterwards. Uh, just a, uh, a note that our next webinar is in February, and it's about to, it's about how to manage remote teams. So if you have remote volunteers or board members or staff, um, this webinar will help you uh, do that effectively. Um, just a bit about who is uh, speaking. Uh, my name is Joyce again. I'm the communications manager and with me is my colleague Donna. Uh, she'll be on the back end to just ensure, um, again, if you have any issues about the webinar, she'll be there to kind of help you with that. Um, and without further ado, I just want to jump into uh, the presentation, but a bit of context. Uh, this presentation is not about all the possible tech trends that are happening in uh, like the for-profit industry or even in the tech industry because there are a lot and there are really amazing innovations and I'm sure a lot of us have, are tracking them in our personal life. Um, things like, you know, having Fitbits connected to your phone that you can also check online and have all your goals kind of measured um, through all this integrated uh, 
uh, through all different devices and integrated mediums. Um, but as you can imagine, a lot of nonprofits are maybe not at a state where that kind of technology is useful for their day-to-day -day mission critical activities. Um, so what this presentation is really about um, are the trends that will affect day-to-day -day nonprofits and things that will affect them you know, hopefully <laughs> impact them this year, but also very immediate. Um, so if you have any questions about other trends that you're like you heard of and um, isn't covered for today, feel free to chat uh, the the trend to us um, uh, in your chat box or your question box, and I I, I can speak to it a little bit. Um, but again, these are kind of curated, uh, curated um, five trends that I believe um, is more suitable for for nonprofits, especially in the Canadian context. Uh, so for the first trend is data visualization and automation. And these are really big words. So the first thing I want to do is do a pulse check because I do want uh, your nonprofit to think about um, um, you know, how, how does this trend apply, um, I guess, most immediately. So I'm just starting a poll right now. Uh, so you should be able to see it on your screens. The poll is, how does your nonprofit use data? Um, and again, the options are, are just generic, and this is just a poll of how, how you feel. So it doesn't have to be... Um, completely accurate, it doesn't need to be like you need to check with your tech person or with your colleagues, uh, just what you think um, or how you feel you're doing. So things like uh, you, you're not sure if you're collecting data, that's totally fine, or you know that you collect data, but again, um, you know, it's the habit of making it part of your day-to-day -day or even week-to-week -week, uh, decision making. Um, or maybe you're in the last category of you do uh, collect data, you regularly review it, and that's actually great. That means you have a data inform culture um, and that's something that we should all strive towards so um, hopefully you can also see everyone else's uh, responses coming in uh, we have 85% um, in involvement so I'm just going to close it now and launch uh, the results uh, so here this is actually really great um, you can see majority of the audience now that we are um, where we skip that uh, I guess the the um, the hindrance block of is data important. Um, there are still a few of us that I, you know, you're not sure if you're tracking data, so there will be a, a portion for uh, for you on like next steps on how to do that. Um, but it's good to know that a lot of us are uh, pretty much on board with the with the data trend. So I'm just gonna uh, hide this poll and keep going. Let me just double check. Yep. Okay. So we're back to the presentation. So this trend, um, what is it? So a lot of uh, the audience right now, uh, we're familiar with data and hopefully with dashboards. Uh, the emerging trend is to have more automated dashboards for internal and external use. Uh, so you might have things for a specific department, like maybe for your tech team or for your fundraising team, um, but more, you know, program staff is asking for impact dashboards. And I'm sure um, there are more like board members who are uh, really enthused by data and they want to see how every part of your organization is doing, um, which is, you know, easier uh, to request than it, it is to program and, and configure. Um, a lot of donors and funders are also asking um, for external uh, dashboards so they can see the impact impact of their donations and where where is it going to you know which project especially if they if there are restrictive funds involved um, so again um, this trend is to have these dashboards and automate them so so you can reduce kind of manual labor uh, so a lot of us are sort of in this boat but just to kind of reiterate the importance the basic principles of why automated dashboards are important one it does help you look at your data real time so uh, you're more equipped to make smarter and more timely decisions. Uh, we had members who, um, you know, when they want to generate a report, it would take upwards of a month. Uh, and some of you are probably uh, maybe in this boat or you used to be in this boat where it takes a long time to generate one report for maybe one program. You know, how many people are coming in, um, you know, call to actions, conversions, all of that in one place. Um, you can probably imagine all the different source data um, that one person will need to uh, gather in order to make that one dashboard. Uh, 
if you're able to automate that process and configure it from the start so then you can measure it as your program goes, um, then any kind of hiccups along the program, maybe you see a downward trend, you're able to pivot right then and there instead of learning a month later that, oh, the program wasn't doing so well, maybe we should have increased you know, promotion, maybe we should have adjusted the curriculum um, or inserted more funding. Um, the next, like, why is this so important is the accountability, and this is especially for external dashboards. Um, it shows that your nonprofit um, is accountable for the funds that uh, you're, you're fundraising for um, and that you are uh, impacting the, the communi communities that you have said that you would serve. Um, dashboards are also really good to digest data. Um, on, I'm sh like majority of people here, you, everyone is collecting data from um, like email data, website data, uh, donations. There's a lot of different facets of, of fields and, and um, data that you have. Um, that doesn't mean that you're looking at all of them because it is uh, a, a huge amount of of things to for, for a nonprofit to sort through. Um, and if you look at this at a larger perspective, it's actually estimated that online, um, especially if you look at all the industries, there's more data that is being created exponentially. Um, it, it generally doubles every two years. Uh, so then the amount of data that is out there is growing um, at, a, at a really high pace. Um, so because of that, it doesn't mean that we need to, you know, not track the data or not produce the data, um, but we need to find meaningful ways to digest it. Um, dashboards are really good for that. Um, and then it ties into the last point. Dashboards are very good to digest, you know, to to get a state of the health for your organization. But if it if it's all manual, um, it does increase the time for you to, you know, get the get the data that you need. Um, it also reduces human error if you're able to kind of remove as many manual processes as possible. Um, so these are the elements of, of why an automated dashboard is, is, is good to embrace. Um, and again, a lot of us are kind of in the same boat, uh, but it's very interesting because there was uh, another study by, by Google um, about data-driven organizations. And again, this is um, information that, that was released uh, a couple years ago, um, but it's still very significant and it still applies. And this trend is still apparent in not just for-profit, but non-profit as well. Um, so here you can see like Google, the results that they found is highly data-driven organizations are three times more likely to report significant improvements, but yet 62% of executives still rely more on experience and advice than data to um, make their decisions. Uh, so as you can see here, still majority of executives, and I'm hope hopefully this number is going down, but it's still at least like a good half um, of uh, people in influential positions that, you know, still rely more on expert advice um, and experience, and there is a time and place for that, but having a more data-informed culture does improve results. So having automated dashboards kind of at their disposal and them being able to kind of educate themselves on um, you know, how the organization is actually doing, what is actually working, what isn't working, will also help this movement as well. Uh, so what next? Uh, the first step is if you don't currently have a data-informed culture, that is actually where you start. And it seems kind of counterintuitive because um, usually people want to have like um, a template, a dashboard template or some sort of code or a, a consultant that can immediately make the dashboard right then and there. Um, but I'm sure many of us have experienced uh, failed projects where the intention, the planning was all there. It was on, on uh, it was following the right critical path, um, but the point that a lot of tech projects fail is at the staff adoption point. Um, if you are the only person in your organization that that values data, values a data-informed culture, um, your next big step is to get more people on the same page. Um, and here I'm going to quote Blackbaud, uh, if data isn't part of your nonprofit culture, make that a big goal this year. Um, Again, going back to a lot of the reasons why uh, these dashboards and especially automated dashboards are so important um, is because a lot of people are asking for it, internal staff and um, external supporters. Um, but the first foundation is to have that culture of valuing it and also propelling that forward. Um, so 
to build that culture, first you need to plan what kind of um, information you need and what kind um, of dashboards you need for each facet of your organization. You know, look at all your different departments. Do they have the tools they need? Do they need to access? Do they need to see data in order to make decisions in their in their day to day operations? Um, plan that first. See what it would look like. Um, even down to things like um, different types of charts, like. Is it a line chart? Is it a pie chart? Is it, is it a bar graph? Even little de details like that will help make um, a dashboard more effective when it is made. Um, and you know, just like when you purchase um, a new technology product or even when you you know launch a website, uh, the the biggest I guess. Um, area that you need to invest in is the maintenance. So a data-informed culture isn't just building it, but it's to nurture it as well. And it is a continuing process. When you have a dashboard, it's about sharing the insights to encourage that culture, learning from it to get feedback from your staff saying, you know, this dashboard was great, you know, three months ago, but now I really want to see this aspect of our supporters tweak, tweak it um, and then share it again. So it's a, it's a continuous cycle. Um, so an example would be, uh, I, I use us because I have access to our dashboards, um, but an example is we do have weekly meetings where we review all of our data, um, and this is shared uh, to all, uh, all eight of us at TechSoup where we can see you know, how we are at in the different facets of our organization. So this one is the marketing dashboard, but we, want, we have one for ops, and then we also have one just um, sort of like different aspects of tech as well. Uh, so some resources to get you started. Um, the first one is if you if you haven't um, heard of Zapier, they're a platform that connects other web platforms uh, together, web applications together. Um, so the the best way to explain it is the screenshot where um, you can see that Gmail is attached, uh, is connected to Dropbox, and is connected to another application called Slack. Um, this is actually a great resource, especially if you want to get your hands kind of started with automating some things uh, because it can push data from one application to another on a regular basis. Um, and again, they do have a free account. Um, there are some limited applications with the free account, but it's really good to play with to see um, kind of like your nonprofit's appetite uh, with automating dashboards. Uh, and the next three areas are sort of like starting points. So for the poll, uh, the 10% that says, you know, we're not sure if we're if we're collecting data or you know how how we're using it, um, the first place I would start off is with a static spreadsheet. It's not quite automated, um, but it will kind of whet your appetite on what it takes to build an effective dashboard um, to get kind of your creative juices flowing in that sense. Um, and then for the the rest of us who you know are collecting data, but you know maybe there are some other rooms for improvement. Uh, the two other areas is built-in dashboards and also um, external business intelligence reporting tools. Uh, so the for, for the first audience, if you don't have or if you're not sure um, where your organization is at with dashboards, um, I do recommend just starting you know with the small steps. If you are more on a Microsoft environment, I recommend this resource where um, this developer actually made a lot of pre-made dashboards uh, using Excel spreadsheets. Uh, so this is a dashboard that feeds information from other sheets within the same file. Uh, so then you can take this dashboard, download it, tweak it to what you you know think you need, um, and then input in your data set. And then the first the, this, this first view, the first sheet, is the dashboard that will pull the information from, from your raw data. If you prefer a more Google environment, um, Zapier actually has a Google uh, Sheet dashboard that you can use as a template. Um, it's the same sort of um, concept where it's uh, pulling data from this from different sheets of the same file. Um, if you're, you know, on the other spectrum of like we we are pulling data and we're just not, maybe not regularly using it, uh, think about the data sources that you want to have a dashboard for. So maybe it's your website, maybe it's your email, maybe it's your it's your database, your your CRM. Um, first think about where what kind of data you want to see and then you, looking at the platform that you have see if they have a built-in dashboard um, this is a good first step for um, especially if you want an automated one to build a dashboard within the same platform and have it you know update automatically and pull automatically because it's within the same um, I guess, sweet. Uh, so for example Google Analytics uh, this is a dashboard view um, that like as users, you could customize using these things called little widgets. Uh, so the things that you see here with like active user sessions and source, um, 
that was uh, configured by 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 me because this is the information that I want to see for marketing. Uh, when you just set up Google Analytics and you put it on your website, um, a lot of people don't actually customize the dashboard, so the, all they see is a lot of numbers, a lot of sources, a lot of referrals, um, but that's not always helpful. So the first step is to build a dashboard within the same tool. Another example could be your email. Um, so for us, we use MailChimp, uh, and in the past, before we moved, we didn't really have an area where we can look at all of the email uh, campaigns um, by, you know, the type of campaign. Is it a monthly newsletter? Is it a survey? Uh, it's a lot of like pulling the data straight from the email campaign into Excel. Uh, with MailChimp, I've decided to uh, play around with their reporting function. It's not super advanced, but it's better than a manual update. Um, so again, that's an example of just starting within the same tool. Uh, and as for your own CRM, um, an example would be Salesforce. If you have a lot of data in um, your CRM and your database, and you want to be able to pull that out and see that on a, a more uh, like uh, aggregated basis, uh, Start with the start with the platform. If it's not Salesforce, if it's like Civi CRM or even Razor's Edge, they do have built-in reporting functions. Um, so the best way to start is to start there, build it out, see what you need. Um, so then at least you have an overview of all of your uh, platforms in, in in one place. Um, and the first, those of us that you know have that and they want to take this step further and kind of start combining all the different reports together, this is where you might need an external um, business intelligence tool or a reporting tool. So for example, we have Tableau through TechSoup Canada um, Technology Donations Program. It's an enterprise level tool where you can insert as many data sources. So it can be something as simple as a, a manual Excel spreadsheet to a live database like Salesforce or uh, Civi or your um, or other CRMs, you can connect them into one one area and then configure your dashboard so then it can display the information and, and kind of parse it out. Um, it is a very user friendly interface, but usually with business intelligence tools, it is a lot harder to um, you know organize the data if they if they haven't been cleaned. So there are additional steps involved, but these are the the tools that I would recommend if you want to take it to the next step. Um, another example would be Zoho Reports, and they have free and paid plans. This is actually what we use internally at TechSoup. Um, so the earlier screenshot where I shared like the marketing dashboard, that's actually Zoho Reports. Um, and then lastly, Microsoft. Uh, business intelligence. So they just opened this up. Uh, so it's free for everyone to use. They do have a pro plan. Uh, but again, if you prefer a Microsoft environment, this is a great way to kind of uh, test your ground with having an automated um, dashboard, but still within the Microsoft environment. And it does inter, uh, integrate with Microsoft Office 365 and other um, online Microsoft tools. So the first trend is very meaty. I spent a lot of time on it um, because it, it, there is a lot of information out there um, and I've just kind of like scratched the surface. So if you have more uh, questions about it, please type it in the chat box. Uh, the next four trends will be a lot faster, um, easier to digest. Uh, the next one is having clear and clean user interfaces. Um, so again, I'm going to do a quick pulse check uh, so you can start thinking about how this trend applies at your nonprofit. Uh, so the basic question is, you know, how do you feel about your nonprofit's website? And again, this is just a check on emotions. Um, you don't have to double check with your designers or your comms team or your tech team. Um, it's just how, how do you feel about it? Do you, do you like it? Maybe you recently designed it and it's exactly the way that you uh, envisioned and it's and it's fine, um, or maybe you you like it, um, it's good enough for your supporters, it's good enough for your staff, but of course there's always room for improvement. Um, maybe you're in the boat of like, it's it's okay, it does the job. Um, people can find your organization, they can donate, um, they can you know pull information uh, about your, your activities and maybe some of your, your advocacy efforts, but there's a lot of room for improvement. You know things like is it mobile? To, is it mobile responsive? Um, is it accessible? Uh, those are the things that maybe you haven't quite checked off, but you would like to. Um, so maybe you are in the plans of redesigning. So that's another category. Maybe you are designing it right now. So um, 
you know, hopefully it will go as planned and then you can be in that first category of loving it. Uh, so we have 78% uh, of our audience participating. So I'm just going to close this right now and share the results. I always think it's nice to see how, uh, you know, your, your other nonprofit colleagues feel about their website. And this is hilarious because, not, a, not hilarious, because I, I myself, if I were to check, I would, I think I would be in maybe the third category of, you know, it's okay, but I would love a redesign um, for, for Texas Canada. But that's just my personal opinion. Don't quote me on that. Uh, and this is actually very interesting because it reminds me of this uh, quote where a uh, website, especially a nonprofit website, it's equated to a bathing suit. If you want to go to the beach, you need one. But every time you try it on and you, and you go out and you decide on the design that you want, you never like it. But the thing is, you need it anyways because you, 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 you need a bathing suit to get to the beach. And the same thing with websites. It does seem like a lot of people are, are not quite you know, happy with it, but they do need it in order to have a presence online. Um, so I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Um, so that is to just get you thinking about you know, what it is about your website that you like or you don't like. Um, because the next trend that we're going to talk about is having um, clear websites and specifically a user interface. It does tie into user experience, um, but I'm going to focus more about user interface because it's a little bit easier to grasp because the whole field of user design, or sorry, user-centric experience, um, it's it's very theoretical and it's very configured to your nonprofit. Uh, so specifically, what is a user interface? It's how people interact with your website or with computer applications. Um, so here you can see some user interface elements. It's things like how do they contact you? How do they click on a button? Is it a button? Maybe it's a hyperlink, uh, a text hyperlink. How do they search for something on your website? Um, how do they comment? How do they get in touch with you? Uh, in order for them to do that, there, there needs to be an interface that that users use in order to, you know, get in touch with your with your staff. Um, the emerging trend is to favor very clean, very clear and accessible user elements, um, user uh, sorry interface elements over things that are, you know, very unique, very fancy. Um, so basically, form follows. Sorry, yeah, form over function. Uh, so why is this important? Um, I'm, I find that it's easier to explain it with uh, an example. So I like this joke because it, uh, sorry, I like this analogy because it's, it, it kind of touches the importance of a user interface. Um, so a, a UI is like a joke. If you have to explain it, it's not that good. That doesn't mean that you can't explain it. You definitely can explain how to use your website to your users, but that means it's not quite clear and it's not quite accessible. Uh, so here is an example, and I'm never one to want to shame other nonprofits, but you know this is Yale University and they're in the States, so I'm just going to pick on them. Uh, so this is a live website. If, you're, if you don't believe me, you know, go to this website after the webinar. But this is their main page. Um, it's very busy, but there is, you know, some design elements to it that is, you know, very intentional. So here I'm going to ask you to guess the links. Um, so we're not going to do a poll because it's very hard to determine, like, what is a link, what isn't a link. So just take a minute to kind of scan um, this this website, this front page, and if you are a user trying to find out more about this art program, um, where would you go? Like, what would you click on? What are the, some of the things that, you know, scream out to you that, oh, this means it will lead me somewhere else? Um, or you're, you know, maybe not sure something you would think, oh, maybe I would try clicking on that. Um, so here I'm going to reveal what is the actual links. As you can see, there are uh, they're all differently styled. So the menu on the left-hand side, um, there is no really strong signifiers that these are links, but the way that it's organized, you know, because we've been using the, like, been online for a long time, we can guess that these are links. So most likely you, you, you guess that these are things that you can click on. Um, but if you notice at the bottom, the grayed out text, those are also links, uh, which is kind of odd because there's like a visitor login, there's a page history, and it's kind of hidden. Um, then on the actual body of the website, these are clear links, the blue underlines. We've been taught since the 90s that these are links, so you know, this is a little bit more clear. Um, but the links on the right-hand side, uh, it's 
like you can click on it, but it matches the style of the body paragraph. So it can be very confusing. Um, so why is it important to have a clear user interface? Uh, one, our users' uh, attention span, and we're in the same boat because we, we, we make up the stat, um, is getting shorter every year. And this stat is actually from 2000, 2015, so I'm sure it's even shorter now. Um, but the, the general trend is because there's so much content on, on, online, you know, calling back to the first trend of, you know, having a lot of data available, having it, you know, double every two years, uh, that means there's just a lot more things for us to get through. Uh, so when users land on a website, before the quoted time was you get 10 seconds of their time before they leave. Now it's closer to eight seconds. And again, this is two years ago, so maybe it's closer to like six seconds. Uh, so you don't have a lot of time for the user to understand you know, where they need to go. Um, maybe they were led by a friend or uh, an ad online. Depending on how they reach your website, there's, a, you know, you can add to that intention span or shorten it, uh, but you don't have a lot of time to keep them on your website. Um, so if it's not very clear and they're not sure where to click, um, most likely your your bounce rate for them to exit your website will be higher. Uh, so again, if you have a clear user interface and they know, you know, generally where to go, it does increase conversion rates. And conversion can be things like maybe you want them to donate, you want them to sign up for your newsletter sign up petition, volunteer, or maybe you just want them to read more about your about your nonprofit so they can help spread the word. If they know where to go and they know exactly where, where to, what to click on, it will be easier for them to take that action sooner. So then that leads into helping create a confident user, user experience, uh, which will help them stay on your website longer, help your supporters be more engaged online. Um, so what next? Just very basic tips. Um, there are more things that you can learn about um, online, um, but very quickly, when you're, especially if you're currently redesigning your website, use consistent terms uh, and what we call signifiers, or sorry, what uh, web designers call signifiers. Uh, so here's some examples of what signifiers are and just be consistent on what is a link um, and what is a, maybe an interaction point. Um, sometimes it doesn't always have to be a link. It could be, you know, when someone hovers over a specific text, a pop-up comes up. Be consistent with what, what that looks like so then you can start teaching your users what to expect on your website. Um, the next thing is, you know, you should design for your users and hint you are not your user. Even if you identify yourself as the audience that um, you're, you're trying to serve. Um, the reason why you are not your own user is because you already know what to expect. Even if you don't, uh, or e even if you take a day to sleep on it, to test your design afterwards, you, your mind will unconsciously fill in the blanks of like, oh yeah, that seems um, like this will lead to a donation button uh, because I know that that is really important for my nonprofit, so I surrounded it with like a, an orange button. But if it says, you know, uh, something like join the team, that that might not be very clear, but in your mind, uh, you're filling in the blanks as you go. Uh, so when you design for your users, it's about taking your design um, and your plans and testing that with other people, um, maybe not even your own colleagues, but uh, your volunteers or board members. Uh, so some resources, these are just, I guess, uh, a good articles to start with um, about a clean and clear user interfaces. So if you um, are interested in learning more about that, I do recommend these two articles. Uh, so the next trend is system integration, playing nice. Um, and again, I'm going to do a very quick pulse check on how um, your nonprofit is handling uh, your systems. Um, and when I say systems, it could be things like your database, how many tech platforms are you using, um, it could be your CRM, your constituent uh, relationship management system, it could be your content management system, um, basically any kind of tech tools that you have, you know, are they are, are they talking to each other? Are they speaking to each other? Or are you still trying to, um, you know, log into each of your accounts through all these different platforms so then you can get your work done? Um, so here um, I can see uh, like half of us have, have participated in this poll. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly um, uh, give another two seconds and then I'll close it once we hit 70% 70, 70 and I'll share the results. Um, so here uh, is very interesting. As you can see, most of us are using a lot of systems, but only very few of us have it 
all integrated. So this trend um, speaks uh, very close to a lot of our hearts and especially at TechSoup as well. Um, you know, we're not always, um, there's always room for improvement. So we do have a lot of tech systems. So I would put myself in the category of a few of them are integrated, but not all of them are integrated. Uh, so here I'm going to close uh, hide the poll so we can move along. Um, so again, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it's about picking the systems to integrate together instead of picking the best system for that function. Um, and this really comes from a place where, you know, every year there are more and more software solutions being developed and released and they're becoming more and more niche. So there's a tool for scheduling meetings specifically. There's one for just to-do lists. There's another one for, you know, dashboards. So they're getting more and more specialized. Uh, so as a nonprofit, there's a lot more options for us to um, use to, you know, ensure that our operations are streamlined. Um, so while one tool may be able to decrease our workload for that one area, um, as you can imagine, once the tool list builds up, it actually becomes a chore in and of itself to stay on top of all of them. Um, so the emerging trend isn't to not look at tools and to not adopt them, um, but to keep integration not just as a nice to have, but as a requirement. Um, so the best way to think about it is, you know, instead of having five tools that are the best in the industry for that, ex that specific task, um, it's about having five tools that are maybe second best, but they all integrate together. Um, so your end product is actually more um, automated and a lot more useful for you day to day than the five tools that don't speak to each other. Uh, so again, why is this important? Because if you have a tool that is you know, top of line for exactly your needs, why not use it? Um, later down, you know, long-term planning, with systems that are that are integrated, um, wh whether it's one way or two way, is you do build richer data. You have a, a more complete view of your supporter, whether they donated online, offline, whether they're a volunteer, whether they supported uh, you at a rally, or maybe they attended a webinar or an event. You can, you know, eventually piece that all together so you can see a full profile of, of your supporter. So then you can have targeted communications. Um, again, the worst thing uh, to feel as a donor is like, you know, you uh, you participate and you interact with, with your favorite organization, but they're constantly, you know, not, not quite sure that you were there or they don't uh, realize that, oh, um, you, you, did, you did donate last year, but it was to an event and not on our you know, annual giving program. Um, so having a more complete picture of your supporter will help you tailor uh, your communications and build better relationships with them. Um, and then for your staff, um, you know, they do a lot of work and most of it should be on the mission critical programs. Um, but if a lot of their time is being taken up with maintenance between these programs, um, then uh, I'm sure you understand that the, the, the time that is um, taken up with maintaining the programs, uh, really what does that hurt? In the end, um, the program staff, um, the, the program um, that you're trying to run for your for your community. Um, so having integration as a requirement instead of it just being a nice you have is a step towards a more realistic centralized. And I should put centralized in air quotes, but like centralized system. It's not about one system that does everything, but it's having all these systems that you know play nice together. Um, so not so much like no matter where you go, you can access everything, um, but that the information is flowing through your internal infrastructure uh, so then that it saves your staff time trying to piece it together for, uh, for their work. Um, and again, if you plan for integration, then you can actually automate it down the line. Automation is very hard and like sometimes I, I do, uh, I'm scared about using the word because it makes, um, you know, it, it, inspires a lot of ideas that everything can be automated um, in a camp, but it, there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of configuration there. But if you plan for integration, if that is part of your requirements, it's easier to automate down the line instead of trying to find a way um, or maybe hiring a developer to create some custom application in order to get the two data uh, sources flowing is, is a lot harder and a lot more expensive. So what next? Um, and this one um, is, it's, 
you know, easier said than done is to plan early. Like when you're looking at tech solutions, um, it's okay to uh, be taken by the, you know, the newest, the shiniest little tool that's like very slick, very user friendly. Um, but as you're testing and as you're putting together your list of, um, you know, requirements, you know, make sure integration is one of them. Um, a nice uh, place to start is like it should hopefully integrate with one other thing that you're using. So then you're not, you know, amassing a bunch of tools and silos. If you're able to get, you know, maybe your productivity tools connected, but not your program tools, that's better than having nothing, nothing connected. Um, so that's say that you're already at a place where you chose your solutions and you're like, well, I already trained everyone to adopt it, so what next? Um, try just with a one-way integration. One way is just having one um, information flow from a database, from one platform to another, but not necessarily backwards. Um, a two-way integration can get very messy, very expensive. So try starting with one-way integrations first, um, so then you can maybe take your data from, and when I say data and information, it can be something as simple as your email. Maybe your email can be connected with your project management tool so then you can push tasks one way instead of trying to make it two ways. Um, and then eventually down the line, maybe you can connect your project management tool to another platform so then now these three platforms are you know, at least working together in some way. Um, so some resources, again, I, I do want to mention uh, Zapier because it can connect web apps together. Um, and again, they do work with a lot of third parties, uh, but they might not cover all the platforms that you have. Um, so another place to start is to look at um, what you're trying to achieve. Like maybe you're looking at a survey tool, maybe you're looking at a project management tool, and you're looking at different options. Um, and I, I know I, <laughs> I, I talked about a centralized system is not necessarily one system that can do everything, but it does help if it's done, if it's made by the same company or the same developer. So eventually it can interconnect. Um, so as example, the things that I have on the screen are examples of um, off Office suites, and when I say Office, it's not like Word, Excel, it's just Office productivity tools that are made by the same developer. Um, so then when you do use one um, and decide to adopt another within the same family, they can integrate. Uh, so as an example, Zoho, they have different, uh, I would say, applications. They have a, a CRM, they have a reporting tool, they have... Um, I believe a help desk. Um, you don't have to use all of them at once, but if you know that you know later down the line you are looking into another tool and you know Zoho has it, maybe start with their software so then later on when you are adopting new tools, they can eventually connect. Um, so again, just some resources to help get you started. Uh, so the next trend is back to web design, big and bold typography. Uh, so here I'm going to start another poll uh, just to, you know, again, try to connect this to um, your, your organization. Um, the question, the broad question is, how do you decide which fonts to use at your nonprofit? And again, this is just um, an emotion check. You don't have to check um, with your branding guidelines or, or maybe with another staff member. It's just like very quickly, you know, how, how do you choose? It could be you, maybe it could be your department or your colleague, um, but things like, you know, we, we have fonts that are already specified, so we just pick from that list, or we just use the fonts that we think look nice. So uh, whatever makes the poster look good or whatever makes this website look good, we go with that. Um, maybe it's just about, you know, what is accessible. So then the fonts that are on your computer, you pick from that, um, and that's perfectly fine as well. And there's another category of like, well, you know, I haven't really thought about fonts, so I, I'm not sure. And that's, again, perfectly fine. Uh, so here I'm going to share the results so you can see uh, how uh, each other are uh, thinking about fonts. And it does seem like a very niche thing, but it's, it's very good. You can see a lot of us have specified brand fonts in our guidelines, so then it's easier for designers or even program staff to, um, to make resources because they can just pick from a list. Um, but the next, like I guess the majority, is we just uh, use what looks good. And this is actually great for designers because then it gives them a lot of freedom um, to play around with what looks good for that particular piece. Um, so now that you know, you're thinking about a design, uh, maybe it's offline, maybe it's online, um, what, what is a trend that I'm talking about? 
what am I referring to? Um, so the trend is as more and more um, nonprofits and and like just across the industry, we are embracing this concept of content marketing. Um, and again, content marketing, if you're not familiar, it's more about creating quality content. Um, so then like one, it's good for search engine optimization, um, but it's not, it's also more helpful for building loyalty, brand loyalty, uh, because then you become the expert in the field that you are if you concentrate on producing good content. Um, and with that trend comes with, uh, at, at least on the designer perspective, um, this new, I guess, uh, revitalization of fonts, because you know when you're typing up content, the the go-to medium is um, a text, either a website or an article. Uh, so the emerging trend is to be more intentional about the font um, and the typography that we are choosing instead of it just being um, anything goes. Uh, so more specifically uh, on the web design, it's, so here I'm gonna talk mainly about websites. On the web design um, end, there is uh, especially in like the early 2000s, this trend of Helvetica or anything that looks very modern, very sleek. Um, and these fonts are called like neo-grotesque. So things that look very thin, almost invisible, like quality, it feels clean and it really came with the minimalism movement where a lot of websites are um, more, like there's more white space, It's everything feels cleaner. So a lot of uh, companies kind of defaulted to these kind of fonts because of it had that air of being clean. Um, but you know, after a decade of viewing a lot of these websites and what a lot of designers like to call, you know, template WordPress, um, you know, almost every website kind of has that feel and it's good because, you know, it does um, serve the purpose of having clear websites. Uh, but now people are, made, are opting for more creative and more bolder, uh, more bolder fonts. So things like geometric, something that is a lot thicker, a lot more bold, um, even going back to serif, you know, I feel like Times New Roman kind of ruined that scene because uh, a lot of people were like, no, New Times New Romans, but there is a lot of good serif typefaces that are free um, and it does help a lot with content, absorbing content. Um, so why is this important? Because there's so many elements of your website and web design, like why focus on this one thing? Because um, one, as nonprofits, a lot of us we, we do have informational websites. It's not just, you know, donate here. There's information, you know, for patients, uh, for volunteers, for fundraisers, um, to, to or even advocacy efforts. So a lot of our job is education as well, and we can't get away with producing content for education purposes. Um, so this is a really important trend because it helps make your content more digestible easier to look at and visually uh, appealing. So then you don't have to suffer, so your your design doesn't have to suffer just because you own a, you know, a lot of content on your website. So here's an example of a member organization um, where they pick like very clean, clear fonts. So it still looks good even if it's just, you know, complete text. Um, another reason why this trend is really important is it's another way for you to reinforce your brand. Uh, so this example is Plan Canada. Um, you can see that their logo is like very thick and there's like a backsplash of blue. And then you can see that in the header, the give a child a chance, that's actually text. You can select that, you can copy that, you can right click on that. Um, but the way that it's styled, it reinforces their logo, reinforces their brand. So if you go to their website, you can scroll down and you can see kind of more of that element at play. And again, it's just a visual reminder that this is, you know, you are a nonprofit and this is what you stand for. Um, and then speaking of which, kind of going back to my earlier comment about, you know, the air quotes, you know, word, WordPress templates, a lot of organizations are embracing kind of that clear, that sleek, neo-grotesque fonts, which is very, um, you know, like standard. Um, so if you, you know, want to stand out from the crowd, um, maybe it's time to embrace a different type of font. Maybe it's monospace, maybe it's geometric, maybe you don't want to go back to serif. Um, it will make you stand out from the crowd, especially if majority of us is still sort of, you know, still trying to redesign our website and just trying to make it clear uh, for our users. So if you are, you know, ahead of the curve, um, this is a good chance to kind of embrace where you're at and, and do something uh, more unique, but also very uh, on brand as well. Uh, so next steps, very quickly, uh, determine your font pairings. Again, 
like a lot of uh, us, we have fonts that we specify in our branding guidelines, but maybe, maybe it's about going back and picking fonts that are not just things that are on our computer, uh, but you know, surfing around for, for new fonts that are free, but you can download and use for your, for your nonprofit. Um, the next step, especially for website, is to think large print. Um, this website is um, actually a web book, and this is actually way more exaggerated when I say large print, uh, way more exaggerated than what I mean. Uh, but when I say large print is think about your the body of your website, minimum uh, font size should be maybe 16 pixels to 18 pixels. In the past, a lot of people have been citing like minimum 12 pixels, but if you actually look at a 12 pixel font size, it's quite small. So don't be afraid to go big, um, to embrace that, especially if you have like a nice font that you you pick, you wanna, sh you wanna showcase that. Um, and then lastly, you know, create strong contrasts, um, not just with your designs, but on your website as well. If you have a dark uh, back, background, you know, pick light colors so then, you, then people can easily read them. Um, some resources, and again, these are all free. Font Pair is um, curated by a designer where she pairs a, a few fonts that she thinks looks good together. And if you like it as well, you can download it straight from that website. Or if you want to do your own pairing, Font Squirrel and Google Fonts is like a, a really great resource for you to kind of pick and choose and download and install on your own computer. Okay, home stretch. Last trend is embracing hybrid cloud models, um, and this one is not again not a new trend, um, but to really understand like why this is something that is still relevant, I'm gonna pull pull the the audience, pull the room on how do you feel about cloud computing? Um, in this one, again, just, just based on your emotions, like maybe you love it because you can access files and programs on the go as long as you have internet connection. Uh, maybe you're, you're, you're for it, but there's still some, some, still some concerns, like maybe with security, uh, maybe you're not sure where these data centers are, um, and you're, you know, you much rather have that in Canada. Um, there's also a few, you know, you're, you're indifferent. You're, whether it's a cloud program or a desktop application, you could care less um, as long as you can get your work done. Um, and there's also a few of us who, you know, don't like it, don't like the cloud uh, computing trend because you much prefer to own your data. You much prefer to set things on your own terms. Um, so a lot of us have participated, so I'm going to share the results. And then you can kind of see where your nonprofit colleagues are at when it comes to cloud computing. Um, and again, this is very, uh, uh, actually, this is a, a good aggregate of how the sector uh, across Canada feels about non, uh, cloud computers, uh, sorry, cloud computing. Um, a, f a lot of us like the trend of accessibility, but there's still this concern of like, where is my data? You know, who is actually mining the information that I'm providing? Um, people think about Facebook and Google um, as examples of like, wow, they know a lot from just just little things that you, that you didn't think about, like your preferences or the files that you upload. Um, so here I'm gonna just very quickly go back to the presentation. So what is this trend of hybrid cloud uh, model? So this, what it speaks to is a balance of both those, both those views. Cloud computing, we can't deny it, a lot of software companies are going that route, especially with subscription-based models. Uh, so that's kind of unfortunately where, where it's going. Um, but a lot of us are also concerned about the information that we are sharing and we wanna be able to control that. Um, so this is the trying to do the best of both worlds, having a private cloud, which is really like the old way of doing things, having a dedicated server, um, either that you manage or a consultant manages for you, um, or you can specify that you want it at a Canadian data center, and also using the public cloud, um, and then just picking and choosing where your information is saved. So maybe your internal database for your staff and your supporters is saved on an internal server, so it's still protected and it's on your own terms. Uh, but things like your uh, marketing collateral, maybe your meeting notes, um, your project management tools are online because those things are not sensitive information. Um, they don't have any personal information attached to them, so you're okay with that being on the cloud. Um, the reason why this trend is uh, very important, especially for nonprofits, is again, we can't ignore the trend of a lot of software companies moving to the cloud. Things like QuickBooks, um, if you use QuickBooks, there is the desktop application, but more and more Intuit is pushing for the online version. 
right now they are keeping both supported, but um, you know, who, who knows down the line like where where that support will 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 end. Um, with this trend, you're also able to dictate you know what files you want to have on the on the public cloud. Um, again, if it's internal on Canadian soil, um, then you can encrypt it. You can um, choose how how well protected or maybe even not as well protected as 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 you see fit. So then it's again on your own terms. Um, and then with this trend, you're again able to take advantage of cloud computing. There are programs out there that uh, doesn't touch sensitive information and is still good for your nonprofit. And being able to kind of have those two linked uh, would be useful. Uh, so some resources to kind of like a propel uh, or, or just learn more about this trend. Um, the first one is a resource. It's own cloud. It's um, a free, I believe it's open source or, or at least free proprietary software that you can download and install on an internal server. So it functions and it looks much like um, what you will find online. So it, the interface, I would equate it to almost like a very slick um, content management system, but it's all internal. So then you can set permissions, you can set how often you back up your data, um, and it's just an interface for you to, to do that with. Um, and then you can also connect other uh, servers and create your own internal network. So then staff um, from across the country can also access this as well. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how to navigate this like dual uh, component of having the public and private cloud, we do have an article submitted by a guest author um, about where, where do you start and how do you start thinking about that and planning for that as well. Um, and then here, we just really want to cover uh, uh, very quickly two important tech updates. Um, so coming up in like this this year in July, is the next deadline for CASEL, which is Canada's anti-spam legislation. Um, so if you're not familiar, um, please be familiar with this. I'm hoping everyone uh, listening is CASEL compliant, but this was launched, uh, well, was in action about two years ago, uh, where it dictates what kind of commercial, uh, electronic commercial message an organization can send out. An organization can be for-profit or non-profit, um, and it covers a lot, not just email, it covers website, it covers kind of social media, uh, but the most important is the email aspect. Um, so when it was first uh, introduced and first enacted, um, because it's a huge change, uh, the government of Canada did give us some transitional time. Uh, so the transitional period for implied consent was three years when it first came out. Um, but starting July 1st of this year, implied consent will now be two years. So just a reminder, like internally, if you if you have it set at the three-year implied consent, make sure that it's two years after July 1st. Um, there's another part of the act that comes into um, action, which is the private rights of action. Um, very quickly, this means uh, individuals can take um, other or individuals or organizations to court, so the chances of being sued goes up. Uh, so not to scare you, but we do have a, uh, this is a very important update. There's a lot of resources online, especially the Government of Canada's website about CASEL. Um, I am not a lawyer, so that we actually invited a lawyer to come speak on this topic in March. Uh, so I, I don't have the registration page up just yet, but if you can earmark the date, like March 22nd, um, if you want to learn more about CASEL, that is when it will be happening. Um, um, uh, internet lawyer Manit Zimmel will kind of go over what is CASEL, what does this July 1st deadline actually mean for us and, and how to get prepared. Um, the next important tech update is Google has started to penalize pop-up, like intrusive pop-ups. Uh, so if, you're now, if your website is you know, on this trend of having pop-ups kind of come up on your screen, um, make sure that it's not intrusive. So the examples that um, are kind of shown here are examples of intrusive pop-ups. This means any kind of pop-up that um, impedes the user's ability to look at the content will get a page rank penalty. Uh, so again, this is a very new update. It just started this month. And if you want to learn more about that, um, there's Google's uh, official blog. They started, they made this announcement last year, but right now it's being enforced. So if you are, uh, you know, closely watching your search engine optimization uh, for your website, uh, remember to pencil this in if you haven't already done so. 
Okay, so that is tech trends and web design trends that, I, that we believe will impact nonprofits day to day for this year. Um, now I'm just going to take uh, some questions. And again, I, I know it's like cutting it pretty close. So for the next three minutes, I'm going to try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, so let me just bring up the question box and... Um, Okay, so the first question is, can you give some practical examples of dashboards? Um, what are they? Oh, sorry, this was already answered. So let me <laughs> scroll back down. Sorry, I'm just going through the question box here. Um, so, sorry, let me just <laughs> go through. Mm. Okay, so the first question is, I have, I have an idea of what info my dashboard needs to contain. Um, who can advise us on the best application to use to present the data? Um, so here is where uh, if you have internal talent, if you have your, your own tech team, um, I would say have a, have a dedicated resource internally to do sort of like business requirements, data requirements, um, because honestly, the best people to, to, to decide what to include is your own, your own team. Um, but a lot of times, you're, a lot of people are so busy uh, doing their day-to-day -day activities that they don't have time to design a dashboard. Um, so if you have the ability to spare, um, or not even to spare, but to um, assign someone on your team to kind of gather that, that's actually the the, the, the best person to uh, advise um, and like a, a way to get started is to start asking people like very basic questions like what what do you need to make your decision or like when you make a decision what are the aspects your um, that come to mind so for example if I'm going if I'm on the marketing team and I'm sending out an email some of the things that come into my decision making process is you know who is this relevant for um, I want to see if they click on it I want to see if uh, my email is well received so from there then the the tech person um, can can put some metrics behind it. So in terms of what is relevant, so that means I need some information from the CRM, something about the supporter. Maybe it's um, how much they donated. Maybe it's a type of supporter they are. Um, the next bit is how are they interacting with the email. So then it's about the email platform. So then there's something about open rates, click rates. Um, the last thing about like conversion. Um, you know that they actually find it. Uh, are they actually uh, you know, taking part on the action that I asked them to do. Uh, it's about connecting, um, or finding a way to connect uh, the email platform to the CRM. Uh, so when you're building that dashboard for the marketing person, it's to kind of have a view that would kind of touch all of these. Um, and I realize I, I just took up a lot of time uh, doing that. So uh, because I, I, your time is valuable, um, I will spend another five minutes answering questions. Um, if you want me to get back to you over email later, uh, feel free to, to hop off um, and just note that in the post webinar survey. Um, so again, I want to thank you for, for joining us. Uh, there's also handouts. Uh, which is the presentation slide. So before you leave, you can also feel free to pick up that copy right right now. Um, but again, I'll spend the next five additional five minutes to answer questions. And if again, if you want to hop off, you can do that. Um, so I'll take maybe I'll try to take a question from for each trend. And um, the next, okay, so the next question is, are there any standards now or expected for password requirements? Um, and I believe this is, you know, about security, especially if you're using a lot of cloud programs. Um, actually, the best recommendation is to have a password manager. And password managers are basically one program where, I know it sounds, it's going to sound sketchy, but basically you put all of your passwords into this one program, but this program encrypts it for you. Um, because when it comes to security, there are um, two things, like where the data is saved and, and is it secure? Uh, so when it comes to password managers, there are cloud password managers. There's also desktop um, password managers that you can keep on your desktop. Um, so a really good one that I would recommend for desktop is called KeePass. So it'd be K-E-E-P-A-S-S -S dot, I think. Oh, now I've got the last extension. But if you Google KeePass, um, it is a desktop password manager that encrypts 
I guess, anything that you put inside and you can use that to um, save all your passwords. So the only thing that you need to remember is one. Um, and this is, again, a lot safer than you know writing it down or having it on a notepad on your on your computer um, if you do trust you know the cloud and especially the servers um, that are being managed by external companies uh, there are a lot of great online uh, password managers uh, a, a big one would be LastPass uh, this is a, this is actually a, a very um, easy to use application especially because it connects with a lot it integrates with your with your browser. So then when you input web, uh, your passwords into LastPass, you can actually um, kind of auto-populate them, um, especially if you're accessing web applications. Uh, but if you, if you, if you don't want to go with the password management um, program solution, um, the, best, the best case uh, to follow is, um, you know, to come up with passwords that are uh, a combination of like letters and numbers, lowercase, uppercase, um, and doesn't follow a pattern. Um, so there are automatically generated safe password uh, solutions out there. And again, I mentioned LastPass again, they actually have this free feature that you can access on their on their website where you can just generate a very secure password. And it's it's all random, it's, it's not reused. Um, so that's one way that you can see what a real, like very secure password looks like. Uh, because I want to reiterate that a secure password isn't something that is hard to guess because most of the time is it isn't a person trying to guess what your password is. It's an application. It's a web program or a computer application that is literally following an algorithm, going through all the different combinations of letters, numbers, and symbols. Um, so a really secure password isn't something that uh, is human proof, but computer proof. So again, I, I do recommend going with a password management uh, route. Uh, so I will try to answer another question. Um, uh, so uh, one of the so one of the web design trends is how to make usability tests on interfaces when you don't have budget. What do you recommend? Um, and this is a really good one because I know a lot of nonprofits their intention is in the right place to just don't have the budget to hire like a user testing site or, or a company. Uh, the best way to do it is to like one, plan out what you believe will be a good interface for maybe a website or a microsite, or even like if you're developing apps, um, develop it first, have a prototype, um, and it, it will take up a lot of time, but you will conduct it yourself. So then what you would do is ask, um, your own audience and try to get one for each of your segments. So like a really engaged volunteer versus a not very engaged volunteer versus like a donor, a supporter, maybe they don't, they, they're, they're just passively supporting you, they're not donating. So get a, like a, at least a few of your segments covered. Um, the best way is to actually see face-to-face the -face how they interact with the application. Um, so a really good way, especially if you are a national organization, is to just use a webinar tool like this where you can share webcam. Um, you can also use the video conferencing tool that's free like Skype uh, or Google where you can actually share your desktop. Uh, you can screen share and just ask them to, to use your site. And again, don't lead them with anything. Don't say like, what sucks about it? Or like, what do you like about it? Because in that, those are kind of leading them into trying to say something that will match um, your, de your description. Uh, the best way is to just like, you know, explain that this is a prototype you're looking at, you know, you know, how would you use it? And then just kind of view it from there. And a lot of it is just testing um, what works, what are they picking up on, um, what are the things that they're, you know, very quickly confused about. Because again, going back to that stat of our user um, attention span, it's very short. So very quickly, you'll start getting feedback about what is working and what isn't. Um, but yet, I would say like those are that is a low budget way to try to do user uh, user testing or usability tests. Um, again, if you have uh, some budget, there are organizations that can uh, that you can hire to to do that for you. But the best way is to kind of have that face to face interaction. If you can't have it in person, then at least have it over the webcam. 
Um, okay, so then I, I surpassed my additional <laughs> five minutes. Um, I'm sorry I'm not able to get to everyone's questions. And again, I'm hap I'll try my best to uh, get back to you if I, if I haven't gone to your question and you still want to hear from TechSoup. Uh, but for now, I just want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. So after this session, I will uh, upload it to our website and our YouTube channel. Again, the slides are already uh, on this platform. It's under handouts, so feel free to grab that anytime. Um, but for now, I just want to thank you and hopefully uh, we can see you uh, joining us for the next webinar in February. Okay, thank you so much and have a great day. Bye for now.